Good, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, my name is Nathalie Denoblé, so you can reach me at this uh, email address. I'm a climatologist. I'm a, physical, uh, I'm a physicist by training. Uh, and I work at the uh, Laboratoire des Sciences du Climat et de l'Environnement on, the, on the plateau of Saclay. It's a lab that contributes to all IPCC reports in doing climate simulations, writing the reports, etc. So what I'm going to do uh, this afternoon is I'm going to go through climate change issues. So we'll start with what we observe and what are the causes of climate change. Many things I hope you know, but m hopefully things you don't know. Uh, we will uh, look also more deeper on the distribution of climate change to show you that it's really uneven in time and in space. Then we will go through how do we know that we humans are causing climate change, what are the tools and what are the evidences we use to do this attribution. Then we'll go through the projections in the future and finally I will talk briefly about the roles land surfaces, terrestrial areas where we do live, contribute to climate change and thus are also tools to fight against climate change. Okay, so if we go through the, 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 um, the, the observations and we are going to take a, a very large view of the last 800,000 years, okay? What you see here is the ev time evolution of the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, CO2. And you see that for 8,000 years, it has varied uh, with, um, with some regularity between very cold periods at which uh, CO2 in the atmosphere was at about 180 parts per million and what we call warm periods where CO2 was at about 280 parts per million. And this has been so for almost a million years up to today. So warm periods are generally referred to as interglacial periods, interglacial times, and cold periods are referred to as glacial times. The last glacial time was 21,000 years ago. And up, uh, starting at the, at the industrial uh, revolution, so at the end of the 19th century, then CO2 has been rising and rising and rising and rising and get out of this natural cycle. Today we are at about 417 parts per million, which is quite more than what we had over the past one million year. Do you know when the Earth the last time met this value? How long ago? The, the planet already had this value of CO2, a very long time ago. Any idea? No? So it was during the Pliocene, three to five million years ago was the last time the Earth had about 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. So this very long time period of the Pliocene, the global temperature was almost four degrees uh, uh, warmer because it was at equilibrium, we are not at equilibrium. So we can, if we stay here, we can reach four degrees Celsius of warming compared to the end of the 19th century. And the sea level was somehow between 5 to 25 meters above what it was at the end of the 19th century. So it has been a long, long time since the Earth has not met known, and, and at least known during the human period. Okay? We never had this. So now we are going to narrow the time period a little bit more and just look at the very last glacial interglacial period. The, the before last warm period was 126,000 years ago. The latest warm period was 9,000 years ago. It's called the Holocene. And what you see here, the minus four, is that the very last cold period, the last glacial maximum that peaked at about 21,000 years ago, was only four to five degrees C colder than what it was at the end of the 19th century. Today we are plus one degree warmer. At that time it was minus four degree colder. Minus four degree colder men mean three kilometers of ice sheet over the Canada, the Alaska, England, 
120 meters of sea level below what we have today. In the Mediterranean Sea, you had, um, you had uh, cold uh, mammals in the sea. And the Grotte Cosquer, for those who know, today you reach it by 70 meters diving below sea level and entering the cave. It was above sea level and people were living there. So it's just four degrees colder. So just to let you know that uh, one degree means nothing, four degrees mean nothing globally, but in fact it's a completely different climate. And since the, this last warm period, instead of going down, Temperatures started going down, and then suddenly they went up. So instead, instead of following the natural fluctuations of climate, then we just get out of the natural fluctuations of climate. And the studies and the modeling we can do now tells that we will n probably never enter the, last, the next glaciation. And never enter the next glaciation, mean this is why we tend to call to to call our era today the Anthropocene. It's essentially because human was a force capable of, getting, of, of pushing us out of the natural fluctuations of climate. And if we zoom in again, the last thousand years, and you look at three very important greenhouse gases, so carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, then you see that they all go up very, very quickly. So they, they have no behavior that does not at all resemble the last 1,000 years. Temperatures started to go down, but then rise up again. And sea level also is going up. So any sign that we look at is just going up instead of going down, which would, we would expect due to natural variations. So now we are going to go a little bit into why is it that all this causes warming. So the, the cause of warming are essentially those three greenhouse gases, CO2, CH4, and 2 atmosphere, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and, and nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide and methane are essentially due to agriculture. And CO2, it's, it's, it's the energy we use, so it's the fossil fuels. Uh, 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 mainly. So when we have a stable climate in balance, you have as much energy going in than energy going out. The energy going in for the climate is the solar energy. And that, what, that is what causes our glacial interglacial variations because the, the, the orbit of our planet around the sun is not regular. It has fluctuations three types of fluctuations we can come back if, if you are interested in, and that creates those glacial interglacial cycles. So we know exactly why we have those variations, and we are able to reproduce them with our tools that are numerical models. And so we have incoming solar uh, energy that warms the planet, and then we have release of energy in the form of infrared radiation, thermal radiation, and that is going out. So in a stable climate, there is as much energy coming in in the form of solar radiation than energy going out in the form of infrared thermal radiation. Because we are adding those CO2 in the atmosphere, then there is less outgoing thermal radiation. The thermal radiation is trapped. That's why we call greenhouse gases, because those gases trap the energy that our land, our ocean are emitting back. They trap it in the atmosphere and they send it back to, land, to, the, to the surface. So we are losing energy going out. So the, the, the system is not anymore in equilibrium. And there is energy trapped on our planet. 91% of this energy is trapped into the ocean, which is a massive reservoir of energy. That's why we always say that if we were stopping our emissions, the ocean will still release the heat, will still continue to expand, and so there will be very, very long consequences. You have about 1% trapped in the atmosphere that causes the warming that we feel, about 5% trapped on the land, so it causes the warming, but it also causes the melting 
of glaciers, the melting of permafrost in very cold regions. Uh, 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 it's also about the, those 3% uh, also cause, uh, trapped in the ice. So, this, so, so what we are living today, this global warming, really results from this imbalance between the incoming energy that has not changed and the outgoing en energy that is, that is uh, restricted by the trapping from greenhouse gases. So when we say that the climate is warming, we do not rely only on temperature, of course. Okay? It's not just a thermometer. It's, it's a, a, a large number of evidences that all go in the same direction. You can find evidences on land. So what do we have on land? We have a, a, an extended growing season of, of vegetation. Natural vegetation, if you look outside, if you are familiar with uh, the migration of birds, if you are uh, interested by when the flower comes out, you will see that flowering, greening, uh, migration starts very early, much earlier than, uh, well, 20 years ago, maybe you don't remember. But, uh, so, so it's really uh, increasing every time. And then the, 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 um, the either migration on the other direction, so, so migration towards warmer uh, conditions, the um, senescence of leaves, etc., is also later and later and later. So in fact, the natural vegetation has an expansion of its growing season length, while agricultural vegetation, like crops, they have a shortening of their growing season length because they are created to match a certain uh, length, or not a certain length of time, but a certain amount of energy. And this amount of energy is, uh, is acquired in a much shorter time today. So that's why uh, uh, the, the, the harvest, especially for uh, vineyards, for example, starts early and earlier uh, every time. <coughs> yes? If you stop emitting uh, CO2 now, do we know how long it's going to be to reach uh, the, the equilibrium? Uh, so we, we, it will, the CO2 will decrease for several thousand years. So it's not for it's it's all it's more than a thousand years before we come back to something we we know. Do you want to have the I don't know how whether the questions should be now or I, I don't mind. I just ask David whether he wants me to. We can we can ask maybe I'll I'll have only one or two questions. <laughs> so okay, let's go. I, I've heard that if we were to to stop. Uh, CO2 emissions completely now, the climate would uh, stop heating and yes. warming up almost immediately. Exactly. So this is, this is because we have a competition between two effects. Yeah. One effect is the release of heat from the ocean that will keep up warming. And one effect is that if you stop CO2, if you stop emitting CO2, all the ecosystems, I will talk about this later, still absorb CO2. So there is a kind of uh, balance between this absorption of CO2, which uh, diminishes the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and the release of heat from the ocean. So yes, if we were to stop emissions today, then we would stabilize the climate at the warming level that we have reached now. Okay? So we have evidences on the land. So there is a rain, species range shift. So I, I mean, all the the, you have vegetation, greening of vegetation in the northern latitudes and at high, high altitudes. If you are doing some hikes, you will see that from year to year, somewhere the, the, at, at the, the, the snow limit and the tree limit is going further up in altitude. We have, of course, a lot of evidences in the ice. So the permafrost is shrinking. The areas of permafrost are shrinking. The snow cover decreases in the mountainous areas. You have you have some resorts, ski resorts, that are going to stop uh, being able to welcome people because they need 25 years in order to, uh, to um, amortir, I don't know how, how we call this, the, the, their investment uh, in order to go up the hill and, and, and do things. So, so this is a, a big issue. The Arctic sea ice is shrinking and shrinking. The smallest latest summer Arctic sea ice in 1,000 years that was met uh, last year. So uh, over a thousand years, it's something that is very, uh, very unprecedented. In the ocean, we have, of course, warming of the sea. Of the sea. There is this ocean heat content that has massively increased. <laughs> the, the fishes are moving around also and displacing themselves 
in areas that are more favorable for them. There is the acidification of the ocean that is mainly due to the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, not so much to temperature. And of course, there is this expansion of sea level. So the sea level rise, that is due to two things. One, there is more water in the ocean because the glaciers on continent are melting. So the water is, is into the ocean, so you feel the ocean. But then warming the ocean makes an expansion, thermal expansion, so it raises the sea level also. So we are losing land on the coastal areas. And then, of course, there are many uh, evidences in the atmosphere. So there is the warming of the atmosphere, but there is also the water content of the atmosphere. Maybe you have noticed that we, that we have more intense precipitation events. And we have more intense precipitation events because a warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor. And thus, when the water vapor condenses for the rain, it's more intense because there is more water to, to be condensed. That's just some physics processes. And that's why all precipitation events are going to be, of course, more and more in intense with the warming. And uh, okay, so, so an atmospheric circulation, of course, because we change temperature, we change gradients of temperature, then the winds are changing and, and, and everything changes also uh, on the distribution of where the cyclones co go, where the, 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 um, the high wind storm go, etc. So as you, this is just to tell you that we are not relying only on temperature. So we always talk about global warming. But in reality, it's a global climate change with all its components changing also. So now I want to go into the fact that um, climate change is really uneven in space and in time. So this map, sh this map shows you the degree of warming at a specific spot uh, weighted by the global warming. So if you have one degree of global warming, what you see already is that the more you are in the red, the warmer it is. You see that the continents, so the land where we do live, is always warmer than the rest of the globe, than, than the ocean, for example, and then the globe. So today on the continent, we are almost at 1.82 degrees C of warming, while the globe is at one degree of warming. Okay, so it's almost double on the land compared to the, to the, uh, to, to, to the globe. What you see also is that it's warmer, it's warming faster at the high latitudes, at the poles, especially in the northern pole, than at the equator. So there is a, a change in the gradient between the equator and the pole in terms of uh, temperature and of warming. And this is very important because things are going very fast at those latitudes, it's going a little bit less faster in the equatorial region. That does not mean that they, they suffer less than the poles, but it's really the, the speed at which things are changing is completely uneven depending on where you are on the globe. What is interesting also is to see that here you have a, 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 a graph showing the level of warming and the billions of people affected by this warming. So today we are at about 1.1 degree of global warming, but still you have about 30 to 20 to 40 percent of the world population that already live in a region that is more than 1.5 degree C warmer than it was at the end of the 19th century. When I say warmer, then it's always compared to the end of the 19th century. And you already have thousands of people that live in, in regions that are already at 3 degrees C of warming, especially in the, in the poles, in Alaska, etc. So they already experience something like five degree of warming already. So everything is changing. I mean, the, the way they hunt, the way they live, the way they source their food has already changed in those areas. So that was for temperature. If we now think of precipitation, the picture is really more complex. And it's more complex because we know that at the global scale, the more you warm the globe, <coughs> the more the precipitation uh, uh, effect, uh, the more precipitation you have on average at the global scale. More term, warmer means more precipitation, but you have experienced, especially this year, this summer, that it's not true everywhere. So it's true at the global scale, but as this map shows, so it's the same as the one I showed earlier for temperature, it's the percent, percent change in precipitation 
per degree C of global warming. So when it's in the yellow and brown, it means that you lose precipitation, so it's raining less. And any time you are on the green or on the blue, it's raining more. And what you see is that you have areas in the ocean, you have areas in the pole world regions, and some areas north of the Indian Ocean where they, they, we have experienced already, and there will be more precipitation annually. But you have large amount of, of areas, especially here, the Mediterranean Sea, the south of, of, of uh, Africa, all of Australia, uh, and part of South America and Central America, that are experiencing drying with warming. So the more it's going to warm, the drier are those regions going to be. So it's really a redistribution of the rainfall depending on the warming due to the redistribution and changes in the atmospheric circulation. Yeah. May I ask what are dots in the, in the map? Yeah, so the dots are where we, there, is the maxi, there is agreement between mm. all the simulations or all the numerical studies. And there is, if you have looked at the dots previously, there is more agreement on temperature than there is on rainfall. Because rainfall is something that is very difficult to predict. But what you see is that the areas of drying in many, in many regions are still in very much agreement between the models in general. So yeah, that, that's the, the agreement. So this is really to, to show you that there is this uh, special heterogeneity of uh, influences of climate change. I've just chosen two examples, temperature and precipitation, but we could do the same with any other uh, uh, variable. And there is also uh, um, some uh, discrepancy in the uneven an distribution in time uh, of the warming. So if here we just look at the season of the, the strongest observed warming, so you have December, January, February in yellow, March, April, May in blue, June, July, August in green, and September, October, November in, uh, in purple. And what you see, if you just look at France, for example, is that the summer is the season of the strongest warming in the Mediterranean area. Then if you look at, at the center of France, it's, it's essentially winter that was the season of greatest warming. And if you look at the north of France, it's essentially the spring that has been the season of the strongest warming up to now. So this is also important because we live on land, we grow our, most of our food on land, and, uh, and we breed our animals uh, on land. And, and if, depending on whether it's winter or summer that is the warmest or the wettest or the driest, then the consequences on our production is completely different. So that's something that we need to keep in mind also. In terms of, of uh, um, uh, the time of the season, what is really significant, and I think this is how most of you probably and the people you know have realized that climate change was there, is really the extreme weather events that have become very, this is what we are sensitive to, I mean just a, a one degree warming evenly distributed through time during the year, it's nothing. But when it peaks at specific season, and especially when it peaks at heat waves like we had this summer, for example, or like there was in Canada uh, last year or in, uh, in Australia uh, two years ago, that is something that, we, that is hard, that we are not used to. And uh, we know, for example, that the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of heat waves have increased everywhere, everywhere on Earth, over land areas, but also over marine areas. There are marine heat waves that make, of course, corals, but uh, fishes and, and all animals in the sea suffer. There is also, as I told you, the in in increase in the intense precipitation events, which goes with floods. Of course, the more intense precipitation are, the, the more you increase the risk of floods. And if you increase the risk of floods, you also increase the risk, of course, of losses, uh, damages in terms of economy, but also a lot of erosion so you are, losing, uh, you are losing land, and you can lose fertile land that is just uh, uh, taken off, and, uh, and that, that, that is a problem for uh, crop areas. And in terms of drought, there is the frequency and intensity of droughts that have increased in many regions. 
the Mediterranean, Occidental Asia, many parts of South America, large regions in Africa and North, Northeast Asia. But uh, the, the evidence is that droughts have increased and that this increase is due to human activities is not obvious everywhere. You need to have two things in order to say that something happens and is due to human. You need to have uh, it's some statistics, so you need to have a long series. So when it's a new extreme event, you don't have a, a long series, so you don't know whether you can attribute this to the, to the um, place. And then you have very rare events that occur uh, because we are in a non-linear system and, um, and it can be due to nothing. It can be just, just, uh, uh, um, just a rare event and that's it. So, for example, in 2003, we climatologists were really asked to say that this event was due to climate change. And at that time, we were not allowed because we, we had no proof that 2003 was due to human activities. But we knew that 2003 was going to become the norm. So that's the way climate, climate scientists respond to journalists in that sense. We say, no, this event may not be due to human activities, but this event resembles what we expect in the future. And that's another way to say that, yeah, we do believe in a way that it's due to this, but we have no clues to demonstrate this using statistical tools. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so you just take the Eurasian continent and you look on, on, on the western side. I don't have all the countries, but it's, I, I mean, it's, there is a list in the, in the IPCC report. So if we look at extreme events, let's take the look, for example, of Australia and the mega fires that were in Australia two years ago. And, and what you see here is the fluctuations of the temperature in December in Australia. So you see that th already the temperature from uh, 1910 to today is slowly increasing. And what you see here is the normal temperature at various levels of warming. 1.5 degrees C warming, 2 degrees, 2.5, 3 degrees. And what you see here is the summer of 2018 that was already very, very hot. And the summer of 2019 and the, the summer of 2019 can become the, the norm if we reach 2.5 to, to 3 degrees C of, of global warming. And this is not excluded because if you take all the intentions by all governments that were decided during the COP21 in France, if you put all these intentions together, you reach 2.8 degrees C of warming. And those intentions have not been realized so far. Okay, so have not been revised and have not been realized. So we are for the moment heading towards something in, in between. Of course we have done things, we have slowed down the growth of CO2 in the atmosphere, but CO2 in the atmosphere continues to grow. Even if it has slowed down, it continues to grow. So the Australia is, I mean, now they, they realize that maybe 2019 is just uh, uh, an example of what they will have to face uh, in uh, maybe uh, 60 years from now. Okay, So it's something that they need to keep in mind. So if we think of extreme events, that is a very, very simplified uh, um, way to look at the distribution of temperature, but it's just to make you understand why extreme hot events are going to be hotter and more frequent. So if you take this curve as the normal curve, and you assume that an extreme event is an event that occurs only 5% of the time, then you end up here, okay? So this small red part. And then you have here your coldest event, the 5% of the coldest uh, evolution. But what happens with climate change is that you shift this curve. In reality, you don't just shift it, you also distort it a little bit. But to simplify things, let's just assume that we just shift the curve. You see that the 5% becomes 10 or 15 percent. So what was an extreme event at the time is a little bit less extreme in the future because it's a little bit part of the normal situation. And then you also end up having this very dark red, which means that you have new extremes that you have never met before. That's what happened in Australia in 2018, in 2019, is that the extremes that, that the country has never recorded 
at least over the past 100 or 150 years. So we are facing really extreme hot weather that is new, but we are also losing extreme cold events uh, that we knew, so, uh, so, so winters are really much milder, but that's of course an issue for ski resort uh, area. And if you keep this picture in mind, and you look at what happened here in Switzerland. Switzerland, they have projected their temperatures from 1864 to 2018. And if you just take those two time periods, 64 to 1990 and 1991 to 2018, then you see that in, in Switzerland they have already shifted their curve on the right hand side. So they have already experimented. 2003 is still a very rare and hot, it really uh, it was a precursor of future climate. And 2018 was also a very hot summer climate. So of course it's a little bit drawn by hand. If you were doing pure statistics, maybe you will not reach this perfect normal curve. But it's, we are still really towards this direction and it, it mimics a little bit what we are facing. Yeah. Why is it here in temperatures for ice or is it standing? Because then it distorts the, uh, like the, the cold part is... Yeah, that's because they wanted to look at, uh, at the heat wave time period okay. during summer. That was just uh, the focus of their study. But you are right. It was just, it depends what you look at. Okay. So if I summarize uh, all these evidences that I went through very quickly, so um, I have not shown everything, but there are many impacts that are already irreversible. The loss of, gla of glaciers is something that is irreversible, at least for uh, two, three, four generations. It can come back again in, at one point, but uh, it's almost irreversible. Then you need to define what is ir irreversibility. The melt melting of permafrost also, those regions have necessitated thousands or ten thousands of years in order to, to, to be here, they are uh, uh, melting. The sea level rise, so it's a loss of land, and when you think that more and more people want to live by the sea, this is completely ridiculous. So it's going to be um, some, something complicated. So there is a rapid increase in exposed populations, so we have many regions that can very quickly become uninhabitable. Uh, because this uh, habitability depends on, on, <coughs> on the temperature you can feel and our body f suffers uh, if you are above certain degrees combined with certain levels of, of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere and both are going to go up, uh, atmospheric humidity and atmospheric temperature so the sufferer is going to be uh, bigger and extremes of course are more frequent, more extremes some extremes are combined and some are completely new Okay, so for in the very in the far past, having droughts and heat waves at this in the same period was quite rare. Now we have more and more the combination of drought and heat, heat wave uh, amplifying one another. Okay, so the, the, this combination is something that is relatively new in the history of climate as well. So how do we know that climate change is caused by human activities? So I've talked about the greenhouse gas, so you say, yeah, of course it's greenhouse gases, but that's not just that, it's not just because we know there are more greenhouse gases and the laws of physics tells us that if there is more greenhouse gases then the temperature rises up. We also need to demonstrate that. So what we do is that, so of course we have numerical models, so we have tools in which we put our mathematical knowledge of how things interact in climate so it's huge uh, uh, models where we represent uh, the land, the atmosphere, the ocean, how the land interacts with the atmosphere, how the ocean interacts with the atmosphere, how the land interacts with the ocean, how the, the ice sheets interact with everything. And, but of course our knowledge is uh, insufficient, it's our models are imperfect. But what we know is all the various uh, things that make the climate change. So one thing is the Earth orbit, that's what I told you earlier, and that's what causes the glacial interglacial cycle. <coughs> and this plays a role at 100,000 year cycle. Here we are talking about changes in 150 years or 200 years. The, m the four degree change that I talked about earlier between the last glacial maximum and the end of the 20th century occurred in, in uh, six. Six, uh, yeah, in 60,000 years, okay? And now we are talking about potentially reaching plus four degree in 250 years. 
So it's uh, something that the living bodies have trouble coping with. Then we know there is the natural variability of the system. And that's why one July, one month of July does not remember, uh, resemble the one you will have next year and the one we had pre the year before. There is a natural variability of the system. We have the, the atmosphere, we have the oceans that are two fluids interacting one with the, the other, so creating chaos. And there are some natural variability phenomenon that can amplify or slow down for a certain time period, the warming, for example. Here, the one that is drawn, that maybe you've heard about, is the El Nino events. El Nino events occurs in the uh, Pacific Ocean along the coasts of the Peru. And in these areas, we have what we call upwelling, so very uh, rich uh, masses of uh, water, cold, coming up from the bottom, from the floor of the ocean up at the surface. And those are areas where there is a lot of fishery. And some years, every four to seven years, these systems breaks down, and we have an anomalous warm water there, uh, 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 cutting the fisheries. And so it's a very, very uh, problematic time period here. But it occurs, it's a natural part of the system. It's, it's, uh, it's the atmosphere and the ocean, and we are able to reproduce this in our climate models. And it has nothing to do with us human. It's just part of the system. Then there is the volcanic activity. So, so when we have this natural variability, it can be much, uh, several degrees of uh, changes in temperature, but that lasts only a few months. Okay, so it can be four degrees warmer or four degrees cool, colder than what you are uh, uh, used to, but it's regional and it's in a short time period. It's not something which shows a trend. The volcanic activity, of course, it's impossible to predict. It releases dust in the atmosphere, and this dust in the atmosphere blocks part of the so incoming solar energy, so, so it causes cooling at the, at, at the scale of some regions and sometimes of the globe. Pinatubo, for example, really cooled down the entire globe for two to three years, but it's 0.1, 0.2 degrees C of change. It's not plus one, plus two, plus three. It's a tenth of a degree in terms of change. And it lasts only a few years, and it depends on the amount of dust that was emitted uh, in the atmosphere. Then you have solar activity. A lot of climate uh, denialists talked about the solar activity. Solar activity is every 10 to 11 years, so it has a, a cycle. But again, it's a tenth of a degree. It's 0.1 degree. So it can have fluctuations of 0, 1, 0, 15 degree, but nothing more than that. And then there are all the anthropogenic factors that are, of course, the CO2, the, the agriculture, eh, all the way we need. And so if we put everything in our climate model and we test one after the other, every influence of each of the factors, this is what you have. So you have from 1850, to 2020, the uh, global warming or cooling, so it's an anomaly, a difference between a specific year and the temperature at 1850. The black curve is the observed one. If you look at the gre uh, uh, greenish part, which remains around zero, it's what we have if uh, we only have the natural causes of uh, climate fluctuations. If we just put the natural causes, the, the, um, the, um, the, the Earth orbit, uh, the, the um, natural variation of the climate, this, the climate would not have changed at all, more or less, over this 150-year time period. Then what you have as pink here is the only the greenhouse gases. So only the greenhouse gases, if we take only this into account, we would have reached uh, a climate that would be even warmer than what we have experienced so far. And then you've got all the pollution, the aerosols that we put in the atmosphere, and that leads you to, to cooling because it blocks a little bit of the 
uh, of the radiation. So you can say, okay, let's just pollute our atmosphere and then we'll cool down the climate. That's one solution, but all the laws today, and that's also maybe you have heard about the, the kick of the 1990s uh, in the warming over Western Europe, for example. So this immediately follows the, the laws that were set up to reduce pollution in, in Europe. And that, of course, has aggravated climate warming. And we are going towards <coughs> reducing pollution at the scale of the globe. And this will, of course, increase a little bit more the warming we feel, because so far it has been attenuated by pollution. Yes? Is that even yet taking into consideration the I'm talking about aerosols. It's this one. I'm talking about aerosols. Is that the net effect also considering the fact that it uh, generates a hole in the ozone layer? <coughs> No, the hole has nothing to do with it. The hole is not changing. It's changing the nature of radiation. It's not having an effect on temperature. Okay? So it's really just some chemistry that it blocks the ultraviolet uh, radiation in a certain area, and, uh, and it has no effect on the warming itself. No. Okay, so that's... So, so I in summary, we attribute the change we see in the climate system to our activities because knowing all the, the, the reasons for climate to change, testing all individually and in combination in the tools that we have, which are climate models, only one is able to reproduce the observed curve is when we put the humans. Without humans, we are unable to explain the recent evolution of climate change. Okay, so that's, that's why we say that what we are living today is due to our activities. Yeah. But how can we measure the natural causes? Because we cannot measure cause. So what, do you, what, what is behind the duration of natural causes in the green? So, the, okay, so, so there is, um, so here the natural causes are the, 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 the non-linear the, the non di dynamics between the, 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 the fluids atmosphere and ocean, and also uh, the, uh, the Earth orbit, okay? okay? The rest, what we do is that we try to reproduce very past climates. So 126,000 years ago, 115 years ago, we try to reproduce the curve. Of course, the, the further back we go in time, the less observations we have, or the more, um, the more uh, eclectic they are, so at specific places. But this is why what we do, is that we combine everything we know on, on Earth, every measure that we have, and we see whether our models are capable to reproduce the last glacial ages, the last very warm period, the warm period before the last one. And, and all this is a combination of evidences that our tools are able to do that. that that's, but of course, yeah, the pure natural variability of today, we are not able to measure it. But still we have, again, um, well, I don't think, I mean, there are two, the laws of physics plus uh, our knowledge, everything converges. So it's very hard to discard that uh, it's not us. <laughs> so far. <laughs> I mean, it's a, of course, it's a new, it's a new science. I mean, it's a science that has emerged in the 1970s, uh, something like this. So compared to geology, it's a very new science. So we are not... Um, we, we can still have very strong discoveries. Yeah. Uh, the simulations that combine human natural causes, or is it also match for gases, gases and also precipitation changes? Yeah, everything. everything. Yeah. It's really the, um, what we put into our models is the, the physics of the dynamics of the air and the ocean masses, plus the physics of cloudiness, rainfall, uh, how vegetation grow on land, etc., etc. So it's uh, it's uh, something very, very big, and you have about 50 climate models around the, the world today that uh, do the same experiments, and they have been developed almost independently one from another. So and they all converge more or less. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So now about uh, the the future uh, of of our climate. So. How do we project ourselves in the future? You have, to, you have to, um, to realize that, in fact, we need you. We need people like you in order to, to construct future projections. It's not just climate scientists that construct future projections. And it does not start with climate scientists. In fact, it starts by 
imagining tomorrow's societies. So we need to think about how many we will be. We need to think about what will be our technological choices or advances. We need to think about environmental politics. We need to think about behavioral changes. What kind of, what will be our food habits in the future? How we will exchange uh, 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 furniture, uh, food, etc. in the future. So we need to think about all this. And these are, of course, socio-economists, those are uh, demographers. Um, so there is many types of disciplines that work on those trajectory of, of the future of our societies. And then from those different trajectories, they derive evolutions of greenhouse gases evolution of pollutants, evolution emissions of course, evolutions of how we will use the land. Are we going to have more or, or less agricultural land, more or less forests, more or less cities? And we put all this information in our climate model and then we run our climate model for the future. So we come really at the end of the, of the, of the work because there is all this that needs to be done, okay? And you have to keep this in mind because when you look at, at projections in the future, you are just going to look in, in fact as impacts. Uh, what, are, what will be the loss and, and damages, for example, for a certain uh, activity. But in fact, there is a chain uh, before and the first chain starts with demography. There is suddenly a, a collapse in demography. Nothing holds. None of the, of the scenarios that we have produced is going to hold, okay? So this is something, so anything is, that's why we don't talk about prediction for the future, we talk about projection. A prediction supposes that you know what is at, at instant T0, and then what will happen in instant T plus 10 years depends on what was at T0. But a projection is free of that. It's just follow some trends that will occur in our societies. This is just to show when you, again, you think about the IPCC world, you have uh, here thousands of scenarios that have been produced. Those scenarios here are, are uh, spread in five families, depending on the maximum level of CO2 that will be reached in the atmosphere. And you, I told you that we are already around 4, 17 ppm. So this blue one is what we should do where we should stay if we want to meet the Paris Agreement. And you see that this one, the red one, the red family, is the family where there is no environmental law. We just do whatever we want. We continue to produce, we continue to extract fossil fuels. There is no limit. As much as we can burn, there is a limit to the amount we can burn because there is a limit of the av availability. And, and then you can reach very, very high levels uh, of warming. So this is just the curves of the emissions from fossil, fossil fuels. Those thousands of curves, we don't use all of them for our climate models because it will be impossible to, mm, to run our climate models for that many experiments. It's so expensive, it requires massive parallel processes, massive parallel computers. It, uh, it uh, forces us to store tera, uh, terabytes of, of data. So in any case, it's impossible to do this with climate models. So we just take five, four, four, five, six of them and we test them. And that's the ones that you have highlighted in. Those are the ones we keep for our simulation. There is one question there and then you, yeah. Uh, you, uh, simulation, yeah. What, are, what are the demographics and other factors that you so the, the demography here, so I don't have this in mind because those are the socioeconomic scenario. Uh, for a physicist, it's complicated, but it's, it's, it's no real uh, increase in, in demography, but it's a lot of substitutions of any fossil fuel um, energy into renewable energy. It's a change in food habits. Uh, it's a change in productivity. It's a, a sober society, very sober. Sober, so that, that, that really lives with the minimum things, so you just, uh, you, well, you do not buy the last iPhone, etc., etc. Sober, sobriety. <laughs> so it's not luxurious. Sorry? The opposite of luxurious. Exactly, exactly. So it's, uh, it's uh, and, and also here you see that we reach some negative emissions. 
So it means that we are able also to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and store it uh, into the soils or into the oceans. So it's, uh, I think it's going to be very hard. <laughs> you had a question? Uh, I think it's big. Here you mean, ah, this one? I don't know. No, no, I mean like the rate. It's stabilizing? Yeah. I think it's because they reach the, um, the, what they have estimated as the stocks in terms of fossil fuels uh, today. Wow. Estimations. Okay. Because the estimate is always uh, <laughs> going further. Yeah, a last question. And then yeah, we'll I think the last IPPC report used SSP and yeah. not RCP anymore. Could you? Say oh, yeah, that's the okay. So, the, the RCP are the radiative concentration pathways. So, at that time, what we were uh, doing is that we were fixing limits in the amount of warming to be reached. So, for example, the RCP 8.5, it's not more than 8.5 watt per square meter in addition to the uh, end of the 19th century level. So greenhouse gas in the atmosphere can be translated into watt per square meter, so radiative energy. And then to, to reach this, let's say, maximum level of warming, you have different ways, different routes. Those are the shared socioeconomic pathways, the SSPs. So the SSPs are the, the, um, the socioeconomic routes to reach a certain level of warming. In reality, it's RCP slash SSP. It's both. So they name it SSP, but in reality, we, we use both of them. So there is a target in terms of the warming not to be exceeded, and then you explore the route to reach this uh, level of warming. Is that okay? okay? Perfect, thank you. And so when you take those scenarios and then you limit, so here I'm showing two extremes, so the red and the blue, so the the let's say, uh, Paris Agreement friendly and the one where there is, no, uh, there is no limitation. And you see the numbers here, 32, 39, 42, is the number of climate models that have done the exercise. So we always, we never rely on only one climate model because a model is, is imperfect. It has biases. And from one model to another one, the biases are not at the same place. They are not the same. So we are hoping that looking at a large number of models, we are getting closer to the reality where all models agree. And that comes to the dots that we discussed uh, earlier. So if we zoom a little bit here, so the blue one is radical changes, and the red one is what we call business as usual, which if you look at the, the next 20 to 30 years, you do not distinguish between the blue and the red tra trajectories, because we know that, in fact, the climate is already written for the next 20 years, in a sense that it takes more than 20 years to have, even if it is a radical change, it will take more than 20 years. So whatever we do in the next 20 years, it's not going to show up immediately, it's going to show up a little bit further. So what we are doing now will really be seen in 20 years from now, and the next 20 years, they are the most difficult for climate scientists to exactly say what will happen on the ground in order to adapt. But we know that it's already written in a way. And that what we do now is going to show in, in a, a, little bit, uh, a little bit later. Yeah. Does it mean because of our society doesn't change so fast? Or does yes. it mean because the environment changes? Because no, it's essentially. If you stop, then it's like. Yeah, be, because we know that we, nobody will stop emitting okay. so now. But, but we would, if we would like, change the society, Yes, then, we, then, would then we, we would see already a, a, a slowdown of the, uh, of or, 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 or a stop of the warming. Of course, there is a small memory. As I said, the ocean is having a lot of heat, and it, there can be a small delay. But for a very long time, we thought that the delay would be very long, and now the new versions of the model say that the delay will not be long. It will be almost immediate. Maybe tens of ten years, but uh, not, not that much. But it's a combination of both. Okay. So what we do also is that sometimes we look back and we look at whether our models were right or wrong. 
because the first IPCC simulations were in 1990. And so the climate has already realized since then. And if you look uh, at uh, here, for example, the, 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 the report that was published in 2007, the future started there at that time. And all those years have been realized so far. So when you look at what was projected, and in fact, the projection was the, 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 the dark line with, of course, a spread of errors because it's a model and there are several models. And the red and the blue are uh, observations. And in fact, the models were not wrong. Of course, they cannot reproduce those, those small um, oscillations because those oscillations are due to the internal natural variability of the climate system. And all models are not paced with the same internal variability. So when one model sees an El Nino, as I talked earlier, maybe another one will not see the El Nino or will see the reverse of the El Nino, which is called La Nina, and then it will cancel one another. Because it's a natural variability, the models are able to see this natural variability, but not at the same years. And that, least, le, that uh, smooths out a little bit this variability uh, uh, that, that you see in the observations, but still, the trend was perfectly reproduced. So what worries the climate scientists is, what they, is that they say that in 1990, they already wormed the, the everyone that this is what is, was going to happen. And since then, the worst scenario that was predicted in the 1990s has been realized so far. The worst of the worst. So we never went, we never did anything. So now people wake up because we start feeling the, uh, the, the extreme weather events, things are becoming more and more and more evident. And it was difficult to think about, uh, to put our imagination into what will happen. But, uh, and, and nobody moved. So, um, so we, we really follow the trajectory where that was uh, supposed at that time. So we talked about whether it, was, it will still be possible not to exceed 1.5 degrees C of warming. So what we know for sure is that the level of warming here on the y-axis is proportional to the cumulative CO2 emissions since 1850. So the more we put CO2 in the atmosphere, the more we will warm our, our climate. There is a quasi-perfect relationship. So we have already emitted more than 2,000 gigaton of CO2 in the atmosphere. If we do not want to exceed 1.5, there is less than 800 gigaton of CO2 to be emitted. And then, we need to stop. And we emit more than 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. So you just do your calculation. By 2040, we will have exceeded 1.5 degrees C if we do not re reduce our emissions. Yeah? But these days, uh, do not take into account the sequestration of forest emissions if you have ambitious uh, request for policy? It does take everything into account. Yeah, but if you have... Uh, ah, you mean if we increase the, the yeah. what we call the sink? Yeah. Yes, no, no. This is a calculation with today's sink. Yeah. So assuming that uh, the land and the ocean will continue to, to, to uh, absorb the same amount of CO2, if indeed we increase the sink, then it means that uh, our uh, allowance can increase a little bit before we reach uh, 1.5, exactly. So this is how we calculate the, uh, the time that remains before we exceed a certain level of warming. Yeah. One, one, one quick question. Uh, what is the margin for sinks, sinks to increase and to absorb more? Because how about that? That's quite marginal. And that's, that's, that's the hard part because most of the largest um, uh, estimates that have been done have been done without considering the potential loss of agricultural land, yeah. okay? So uh, in any case, the maximum you can reach on land is, not, is less than a third of what you should do uh, at the global scale, maximizing everything. 
and keeping uh, agricultural land, etc., it's less than a third. So that's why if just on land we are making an effort in terms of increasing the sink, we will not uh, go, we will not exceed uh, 25 percent of uh, in addition of what is is, uh, is emitted. So, on the water, people have tried to put iron in the ocean to increase the sink in the ocean, but then you, you, then you perturb your ecosystem. So it's playing God is really complicated. It's geoengineering. It's, uh, people have thought also of uh, putting sulfates in the atmosphere in order to block solar radiation, but without thinking whether plants will have sufficient solar radiation, whether you'll have to put sulfate every year because it's going to go down at one point and not be... So, so yes, there have been studies, uh, I think it was in the Indian Ocean where they have put iron and they really suddenly increased the photosynthesis in this part of the ocean. But uh, if you do this globally, it's a real... Uh, <laughs> so so you've, you've got, I mean, you've got lots of things. Today, you are, uh, so some, some propositions which I think are better is trying to capture CO2 when it is emitted. So when you've got big factories, it's, uh, it's at the top of the factory. You capture immediately the CO2, you um, liquefy it, and then you put it back in the ground. Uh, those is probably the things that is the best to do if you do not want to stop emitting CO2, is really to capture CO2 anytime it is emitted, everywhere it is emitted. But then you imagine uh, riding your car, capturing your CO2. I, I don't know whether it's possible. It's, it's not my job. It would be an engineer to think about it. But I would not play with the natural ecosystems, in fact. I think it's dangerous. Um, OK, so, so that, that's how we, 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 we try to, to calculate the, the, the time that remains um, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, reaching the global warming. Um, OK, so this is just to show you in a so here it's not dots, but it's uh, crosses, but it's the same. Right? It's everywhere where you trust, the models are, are all in agreement. So you see that with temp for temperature, all models are in agreement. Anytime the globe is warmer, everything is more intense. Every signal is more intense. There is no drastic changes from 2 degrees C warming to 3 degree warming. Suddenly things do not occur at the same place. There, there seems to be quite... Uh, 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 simple in that way, everything becomes more intense. And in precipitation, you see that all the drying, the, the drying areas become really, are really significant. All models agree on where it's going to be drier. All models agree on where it's going to be strongly wetter. And then you've got many areas where the models do not agree on uh, whether it's going to be drier or wetter, etc. So there is still a work for us climate scientists to, to do to try to, to understand why. If we think in the future of rare, rare or extreme events, here we, I'm just going to take examples of hot temperature extremes of a land. So let's look at the left panel. So let's think about an event that occurs only every 10 years. So it occurred every 10 years in the pre-industrial time. With a one degree warming today, it occurs three times, three years out of 10, and it is 1.2 degrees C warmer. If we reach two degrees of warming, it will occur six years out of 10, and it will be 2.6 degrees C hotter. And if we reach four degrees of warming, it will occur almost every day, and it will be more than five degrees C hotter. This was done in the last IPCC report. And what we faced this year tells us as climate scientists that we are underestimating the reality. So probably something we are not capable to really know how warm a hot extreme can be, even in a 1.1 degree warmer world. So now every back, everyone is back working to try to understand what we missed because we are away from the reality, we are under, uh, uh, we, 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 are, uh, under, we have underestimated the reality of how hot it can be, in fact, almost everywhere uh, uh, on land. And we don't know why for the moment. 
So it would have been better that we were overestimating it, but we are underestimating it. So then you will have access to the slides and you can be able to look at events that will occur only one out of uh, 50 years. So if we just think of, of uh, extreme events, we'll have more intense, more frequent uh, extreme events. Extreme events that will be happening in new places where we've never seen them before, at other times, and also new combinations of events that we've never experienced. So we don't know how the living bodies are going to react to those new extremes. And if we think of uh, 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 rising sea level, that's one of the long, the, uh, a place where, uh, a variable where there is a lot of memory. And even if we stabilize the climate, the sea level will continue to rise for thousands of years. And the glaciers are continue to, to melt for thousands of years until probably they disappear. Uh, so if you think of a two degree sea warming, which we will reach, I don't know whether we will come back to cooler climate, but at least we will reach. And if we stabilize that two degree sea warming, in 2,000 years, the sea level rise will be between two and six meters. And in 10,000 years, it will be between eight and 13 meters. So that's the commitment. If we stabilize at two degrees, we will commit for generations 10,000 years after us. Okay, so that's uh, also something that is uh, important to keep in mind. And if we think of France, so if, we, if you go on the website of Météo France, uh, and you will see they have a tradition now to represent uh, uh, heat waves in terms of those bubbles with a horizontal axis, which is the duration of the heat wave, the vertical axis, which is the maximum temperature reach, and the, the size of the bubble, which is the intensity of the warming. And the, the yellow um, dots here show all the heat waves that were known in France starting 1940, I think, something like that. And those are the heat waves to come if we go, uh, if we reach something like 4 degrees C of warming. So heat waves that can last three months, two, three months, uh, that can reach temperatures that we don't know and that have an intensity and a magnitude that we don't know. So we are in an entirely, an entirely new world that we don't know about at all. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's, it's the integral of, uh, of uh, above a certain threshold. So they measure I think it was a, the curve of temperature and the duration, and you take the integral of the, of the area uh, below uh, the curve between uh, a maximum level and the curve itself, and it, it measures a kind of intensity. There was another question, no? I was to ask about intensity. Okay. So it's in on the, I mean, we, I can explain later, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's easy. It's, it's really some mathematical uh, curves. Uh, what I think very, um, very traumatic uh, in terms of, of the climate change is to think about areas where it will really become un uninhabitable for the people. So here, let's look at those maps. And you look at how often dangerous thermal conditions are exceeded, dangerous thermal conditions for a human. So combination of temperature and air humidity. And at 1.5 degrees C of warming, you have areas in this orange, which is between three and six months per year already in, uh, in South America, in the Amazon. If you reach two degrees C of, of warming, these areas between three and six degrees going to expand in Western Africa and in India. And if we reach four degrees of warming, you see that areas here in very dark brown are exceeding six months per year. Of, of intolerable conditions for humans. And that's, that's really shocking because we live here in temperate conditions. So we are on the safe side. Not really safe, but still, we don't. The, in this area, it means that people will not be able to work outside, except maybe f during nighttime. They may not be able to live outside. So will they have to migrate? Will they have to construct 
<laughs> no, because air conditioning, if all of Paris was with air conditioning, all, all apartments in Paris, with um, a heat wave like 2003, it will add three degrees outside. You know that air conditioning is just taking the, the hot air inside and putting it outside. So then people, homeless people are going to suffer even more. I mean, these kind of things uh, uh, increase inequalities. So it's really, uh, it's really something that we do not have in mind, is that areas where it will not be able to live tomorrow. And those are, those are the, the areas where the demographers say that this is where population is going to grow. It's not going to grow in, uh, in the developed countries. It's going to grow in the developing countries. And in those areas that are going to suffer more. So it's really very important to think of all these kind of consequences. OK, and, and, and the final part of my talk is really to, to think about the role um, land areas play in the climate system. So do you have a, a, an idea in mind of what is the, the percentage of the land areas that we occupy or exploit today? 10%, 50%, more, less? The whole land, non-glaciated land area. I'm not sure what active use, but I think we have changed around 70s. Exactly, exactly. Good. Good number. So it's 70%. So we are exploiting 70% of the non-glaciated land area for our use, for our food, fiber, etc. And we live, 50% of the population live in urban areas. Urban areas occupy how much? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's written here. One percent. <laughs> you had the response. <laughs> so it's one percent. So fifty percent of the population lives on one percent of the land, but we uh, exploit seventy percent of the land. That's why, when people tell you, "Ah, uh, urban agriculture is going to save the world," hmm. <laughs> I have doubts. Okay. No, it's, uh, urban agriculture is very nice because it helps you to understand how vegetables grow. In terms of pedagogical, <laughs> it's very pedagogical. No, no, you, you laugh. But, uh, but, uh, but maybe you all want with your parents to see in gardens, but I, I have seen with my own kids, some friends of my kids who did, never saw a cow in the field, who, never, who didn't know that, 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 that the chicken they have, uh, they buy, in slices come from a chicken, which is a, an animal. Uh, no, no, that's true. I mean, you love but they, We will be 70% to live in cities. So I think in terms of pedagogical uh, value, uh, urban, uh, uh, urban um, uh, farming is really important. Of course, it's going to help cooling the city as well, because it's greening the city, so it's very useful. But then it's not going to help us uh, preserve some land to grow bioenergy or to restore forests, etc. Okay, so you have to remember those this tiny one percent compared to the seventy percent we need to live today. No, it, it includes everything we need to live. Okay. No, no, everything we need to leave, uh, even, uh, yeah, even industrial production. Mines, exactly, uh, exactly, plants. exactly. And, and uh, one fourth, uh, so, so, and one fourth, about one fourth, so, so the rim, um, of this 70% is uh, already very highly degraded and has probably passed a kind of tipping point which makes it difficult to restore. Okay? So that's, that's the difficulty also, is that most of the land can still be restored, and a fourth of it, uh, we will have difficulty to take it back to a state, because there is already a loss of land itself. So, uh, of course, we have lost a capacity to, uh, to uh, store carbon, to produce, etc. Yeah. Are there uh, sort of similar kind of calculations for ocean? 
ocean use? Which I mean, yes, yes, there is. There is uh, in the special report on ocean and cryosphere that came out in 2019 or 20, I think there is. Uh, I think there is something similar, but it's more difficult on the ocean because it's very deep and uh, there are lots of uh, ocean areas that are, have not been explored at all. Uh, so, so it's really more difficult on the ocean, but they have started to do this also. Yeah. So in Japan, they are building platforms on the, on the ocean. Okay. You mean to expand their land? Yeah. yeah. But it has to be a, fl a floating platform then. <laughs> yeah, like, like people in the Netherlands, they already uh, build on the, on the ocean. So from the land, the land has, a, a, um, a, I would say, a triple rule. Uh, first, it emits, it contributes to global warming, OK? Because you've got about 23% uh, of the total greenhouse gases emitted by our activities that come for, from land, from our land activities. So it comes from uh, deforestation. It comes from uh, the way we, we, we farm. Um, and um, and uh, it comes from the thing that we, we put uh, on, 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 I mean, from the manure, etc. So what you see from this curve from 1961 to 2016 is that CO2, it's 13% of CO2 that is emitted by our uh, land use activities, but it has leveled off over the past 20 to 30 years. So there are some annual fluctuations, but there is no more increase due to the way we use the land. I'm not talking about uh, fossil fuels, I'm just talking the way we use the land. We cultivate and we manage our forest. You see that methane and N2O and nitrous oxide, they still go up continuously. There is no change in the trend of their increase. And those two greenhouse gases are very important because they have what we call a warming potential, much bigger than the CO2 itself. But they have a shorter time life in the atmosphere. So if we get rid of those two greenhouse gases, then we can limit very quickly uh, the growth of temperature in the atmosphere. So that's why in the very last COP, you probably heard of an agreement on methane between all uh, countries uh, in order to reduce very strongly uh, these emissions very quickly. So it's about 12 uh, gigaton of CO2 equivalent per year. If we think of all this, just the food system, it's 21 to 37 percent of all emissions, global emissions, not just the land emissions. If you include also the transport, storage, packaging, transformation, etc. So there is a huge <laughs> potential to limit our emissions by playing with our food systems. The retailing, the packaging, the transport, the, the, the meat, etc., etc. There is a lot of potential here. Waste and losses. We are wasting 25% of the productions. 25%, a fourth, is enormous. Just thinking about, in our, in our countries, in our developed countries, it's really wasting. In developing countries, it's a loss because they have trouble packaging, transporting, uh, um, uh, preserving the food from the time they harvest to the time they eat. But, but we have this technology. It's something that we can offer. So just playing with this, it's, uh, it's, uh, and so it's one fourth of the production and it's eight to 10% of the emissions. So that's not negligible at all. And then deforestation, destruction of wetlands and peatlands, it's 10 to 15% of the total emissions. Here again, stopping deforestation, avoiding uh, uh, dra draining wetlands and peatlands to grow food on them is something that it's, it's an immediate action. It's just, uh, it's just uh, avoiding. And if we do avoid this, then we also preserve some emissions. Yes. Uh, just, just behind you and uh, sorry. For, uh, is this just food system? What about, um, I mean, because, you know, during COVID, there was a great increase in logistical Amazon. I mean, just that alone. Yeah. So have we taken that into account and a projection of how, how much worse we're doing there, um, as well as the increased travel post-COVID? There are some projections maybe on how badly we're going to 
I, I'm not completely sure that in all projection it's really well taken it into account. I think that there is more and more work on that uh, because this is all those numbers came from the, the special report on climate change and land that came out in, 20, in August 2019. And this really was a shock to many people in the food systems. And now there is a lot of work doing, being done to try to better quantify and think about uh, th these terms, I mean, the logistics and the things like this. I'm not sure we have the exact numbers for the moment because it's not, it's not always that, that simple. I mean, uh, we want to increase, for example, uh, food production close to, to, to the city in peri-urban areas, but then it means more driving. So it can increase the pollution due to transport uh, and maybe decrease the pollution from the, the production itself and from secondary uh, uh, people in between, but it's, we are not 100% confident that it will decrease the CO2 emissions in, in, on average. So it's not that simple. Yeah. Um, I think the last mitigation report has the nutrition values for currently at like 17 gigatons per year and says if we do all this stuff, we can get it down maybe in 2050 to 10 gigatons per year. Yeah. Which for me means that we need like uh, carbon sinks, additional carbon sinks on a massive of course, scale. Of course, of course. Um, yeah, that was the, 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 I think your question uh, yeah. earlier was really how much can we save yeah, and from we, just playing on the map? What do we do about these 10 additional gigatons that we still gonna need each year for nutrition for the global population? Like what is the best bet at mitigation at that scale? I think it's really reducing every fossil fuel uh, usage and increasing the land sinks by natural processes like reforestation using bioenergy, uh, maybe capturing the CO2 itself. Uh, that's true, there, there are some incompressible uh, um, uh, gigatons that we don't know what we will do about. And that, that's still an issue. I don't think we have the, the answer for that. No, no, I don't think we have the answer unless um, after that we can play with demography, but I mean, it's, uh, it's something very, very complicated. So, so land is emitting, but land is also, of course, uh, uh, storing CO2, essentially through photosynthesis. And today, the land, the ocean also, is playing a thing. So for 100 molecules of CO2 emitted by our activities into the atmosphere, you have about 21 that is captured by the land, by the ecosystems, all ecosystems, and 24 that is captured by the ocean. Uh, so, so there is less than 50% than of our emissions of CO2 that remain in the atmosphere. So this is what we call the natural CO2 sinks, and that is what we want to increase by regrowing forest, by greening, putting some green everywhere, by avoiding in uh, farms to have uh, um, uh, crop areas that are completely bare after being, having been uh, harvested, and where we need really to grow some vegetation in order to amplify this sink, this natural sink. The worry between this, so we see that we emit 23% of CO2 plus uh, methane plus N2O, but 13% of CO2, and we capture 29% of what is emitted. So this is a, so, so the land is more a sink than a source with respect to CO2. So it's playing a role in that sense. The problem is that with warming, this sink can reduce. So this is showing you the, the land and the ocean sink here, and with different levels of warming that are here in terms of scenarios. So the greatest level of warming, this, this respects uh, Paris Agreement. So today the net sink is about 7, 54%. It can increase because the more we increase CO2, the more we activate photosynthesis for a lot of ecosystems, the more we increase the growing season length so ecosystems can absorb CO2 for a longer time period. But there is a point where if warming is too big, then the sink is going to decrease. The ocean get too much acid, they cannot absorb CO2 anymore. So they are going to reduce their contribution. The soils, if the temperature gets too, too warm, the soil needs to breathe. The ecosystems need to breathe, and when they breathe, they release CO2. So the, the release of CO2 is going to increase, plus we are going to have more fires, more drought, and that's going to kill the ecosystems, and that's a release of CO2, okay? 
So the more we warm, the less this sink activity is going to be efficient, and the more fraction of CO2 is going to remain in the atmosphere, and that can really accelerate global warming. So that's an additional reason to try to limit global warming as much as we can, as fast as we can, in order to, to preserve this uh, friendly uh, behavior of our ecosystems. So that's at the global scale. So the land plays a, a role at the global scale, being a source and a sink of CO2, so affects directly global warming. But at the scale where we live, it also plays a role, and that's why we green our cities in order to cool our cities, is because there are continuous exchanges between the land and the atmosphere, exchange of, exchanges of CO2, of course, but exchanges of water, exchanges of heat, uh, exchanges of aerosols, uh, so there are all sorts of exchanges, and those exchanges affect the place where we live. It can change the humidity that of the air we breathe. It can change the temperature. If you go under the shade of a tree, you will have an, imme an immediate comfort because it's shading, and it also it transpires because it transpires, then it takes energy out of the surface and, and sends it in the high atmosphere. So at the level where you live, you have this sensation of coldness. So the, this, this has to be taken into account in landscape planning in order to ease the conditions where we live. OK, so that's something we need to have. Uh, 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 so all the experiments show that any time you increase the greenness somewhere, you decrease the value of temperature during extreme events. We know that around above a forest, storms are probably less intense than over cities because they don't fuel themselves with as much energy as they do over the cities. So for extreme events, greening the surface has a really big impact. And we know that drying soils can amplify the severity of heat waves and reversely, wetting soils can dampen the, uh, the uh, severity of heat waves. And again, this is why we think about greening the cities. That's part of the issue. It's not really to store carbon, because it's, again, it's a very small fraction to really capture carbon and increase the sink. It's not to feed the people. It's really to cool the cities and to have cities that are more comfortable. Yeah. Um, I heard somewhere that um, it's not a good idea to, to put like, a lot of plants in like, desert areas because like, uh, there would be more water in the atmosphere and that would contribute to global warming. So Say it again, I'm not sure I understood. Like, it's, it's often an argument you should like, plant like, a forest in the desert so okay. because it's good for the environment. And the argument was that um, because it's so hot there, you would like, um, they would, um, what is? Put like some water in the, in yeah, the increase greenhouse gas in, uh, through, through the water, water vapor. That, that's not, cor uh, well, of course water vapor is the first greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Without water vapor, our planet will be minus 15 degree, minus 18 degree instead of being plus 15 degree. So thanks to water vapor, we can live. But the additional water vapor that is due to climate change is nothing compared to the greenhouse gases that we emit ourselves in the atmosphere. So it can be very um, marginal uh, consequences locally, but we, all experiments, even in, in the deserts, have more uh, shown that we do cool the surface than that we increase the global warming in itself. But you are right, it's a compensation. So, and of course, when we give the temperature of the global warming, it includes the fact that the atmosphere has more water vapor and thus has also an increase in this greenhouse gas particularly. In the deserts, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, diff it's different things because it's, uh, you have to, to take um, water in the, um, in the underwater, in the ground storage, and uh, it's, it has been there or it has been recharged in thousands of years. And we are not sure that the turnover is going to, to, to fill. So 
I'm a little bit uh, reluctant with those global experiments uh, and, and what they show really. It's really, uh, but in terms of water vapor, so unless there is a paper I don't know about, which can be, um, but I would be, I mean, if, if there is one, I would be interested to, if it's not one I read, I would be interested to read it, if you have one in mind. And, and the, the, the last thing about land is that um, if you change land somewhere, it can affect climate elsewhere. Okay, it's not an immediate effect. It's not a local, it's a local effect more or less in terms of temperature, but it can be a non-local effect in ter terms of precipitation. You've ha you have areas that have been deforested on the globe and that have more precipitation since they have been deforested and vice versa, you have area that have been deforested and ha that have less water, less rainfall than uh, before. And in fact, if you just take this example, that was, uh, that's an experiment that was made in the uh, California, I think, yeah, it's in California, where they want to, um, to, grow uh, to grow food on the small um, uh, mountain. And so they, they, want, they, are, they have started to plant a forest in the valley that they irrigate so this forest is transpiring because the dominant winds will bring this air mass further upwind. In fact, this water vapor is transported on the mountainous area where it condenses. And it condenses, then it brings sufficient water to grow vegetation. And also there is some gravitational drainage that brings the water down to the valley again. And slowly, the hypothesis is that they will be able to stop irrigation because the water that will come from the hill will be sufficient and that you'll have a self-sustained uh, uh, climate. So those are things that we know a little bit by theory, we still need to experiment, but those are things that we can play with probably and because, because we know that the effects can be downwind and not just local. Yeah. It's not, it's a sort of geoengineering, but it's not, um, I think you are not really playing with, um, if you put iron in the ocean, it's not, uh, it's not normal. If you put sulfate in the atmosphere, for me it's not normal. Here you just, it's what we call uh, nature-based solutions. It's a little, uh, of course, maybe naturally this valley would not have a forest. Yeah, that's right, that's right. You could say, but this, if you want to do this, you'll have to do this every year. You need energy to go there. How many, how much amount? I don't know, I mean, that, that's, um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's an ongoing debate and I, I don't know when it will be solved or whether it will be solved. I have the tendency to, say, to think about, so this, yes, you are right, it can be called geoengineering. We just tend to call it nature-based solutions. Uh, maybe it's just playing with words, <laughs> but uh, yeah. To uh, go off with his question, yeah. um, like the experiments with deserts and things like that, but is there not a requirement also to preserve the desert because it has its own ecological function? Sure, sure. Yeah, the deserts, that, that's, that's one of the points that I think is very important, is to keep, um, is to keep its natural function and its natural ecosystem. I'm, I'm not sure, when you do this, you have to think about what you plant here. That's the problem with, uh, with, bio with um, uh, biofuels, is that generally you go and plant trees or vegetation that is not native, that you plant in monoculture, and you, it's a disaster for the local biodiversity. But here, the idea is to plant something that is native, to help it regenerate, and to try to uh, have a kind of small water cycle that kind of is, is uh, self-sustaining. But you are right, we are also playing with, uh, with nature. Yeah. But we have, I mean, those areas have been devastated by men already. Naturally, there were probably vegetation and there is no more. So do you, so it's a, people tend to think that they are restoring something. But you are right, I mean, <laughs> So there is one question here and another one here. And just to reassure you, uh, David, I'm in my conclusion. <laughs>
I just have my conclusion slide, so <laughs> we can talk, yeah. Uh, small question, what's the ecological function of the uh, the ecological function, I don't know. The ecological integrity is something different. I don't know whether the desert has a function. You said that Jesus had to be preserved because they had an ecological function. No, I think it has a, an ecological um, integrity. So there is a... There is, so you, this is the question you should ask to Luc Abadi <laughs> because it's his field of expertise. But I think it's just... Um, that you the, the the system is a self-sustained in a way in the desert. So the vegetation, the the animals that live there, they they have their equilibrium. I don't know whether it serves the rest of the planet because it's more or less a consequence. Deserts are there because of the way uh, the energy is distributed on the globe between the equator and the pole and, and, and the, the, the amount of oceans, etc. It's really the result of a dynamical process. It's not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not here because it has a specific function. It's just the result. Tropical forests are there because they are at the place where winds converge and they have flown over the ocean and they are full of water. And ocean and deserts are there because they are at, at the subsiding uh, branch of the, of the, the atmospheric cell. Um, the, the, I mean, for me as a climate scientist, right. as a physicist, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I need to put this uh, first. Uh, the deserts are there because of the atmospheric circulation, okay? And during the Holocene, 9,000 years ago, the Sahara was what we call green, but again, you can explain it with astronomical reasons. And it's because the, the, the way the the, the orbit of the planet was such that there was the, the intertropic, the, the way where the, the trade winds converge was a little bit further north and was bringing more rain. And there was, uh, um, there was a kind of feedback between this growing of vegetation and rainfall, which was self-sustaining. But the reason why the Sahara was green is for astronomical purposes and not for some land or biodiversity pr purposes. Okay, so I don't know whether, the, for me, the desert is the consequence of some, some uh, is there because, and then it has uh, its own functioning. But I don't know whether it serves uh, something. It has its own functioning. It's completely different. I think there was a question back there, and then... No, 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 of course there are losses because, uh, I mean, loss. It's not lost for another place, okay? It's just that uh, the, it depends on the height of the hill, the amount of water vapor. Is it going to condense here, here, or in the other valley? That's, that needs to be calculated precisely, okay? So it's just... Uh, and, and this is where our models are not perfect, is that the, the height of where the water vapor is injected the, the level at which condensation occurs and the distance from the origin where the condensation occurs, you need to have a very good atmospheric model to do that, and we do not have that. So that, that's an issue. There was another question, yeah. No, I just want to comment that I, this idea of uh, having an ecological function, it seems that we are grazing forests, for forests are better than desserts. No, uh, yeah, I think, no, no, you're right. It's so I don't think it makes sense because we've got to see the total in, in No, no, I, I, I think it depends what you want to do. Yeah. Well, if you want to store carbon, of course, the, the forest is going to rank higher than the desert. But, uh, but depending on other things. That's why, but this you need to discuss with uh, ecologists, not with me. <laughs> okay, so I've got, I've got just two slides uh, which are my take-home messages. So I think our actions have broken the regularity of glacial interglacial cycles. That's why we talk about the Anthropocene. This term is largely debated in the, in the, in, among scientists and placed at different times in the past. But still, we have done something that is at the scale of, uh, of major interventions. 
the recent evolution is not homogeneous in time and, sp in time and space and it's without any doubt resulting from human activities. The climate models so far have been quite good at reproducing past trends at the global scale, not region by region, of course, huh? really at the global scale. Uh, and they really agree on the main upcoming risks, which is uh, the proportionality between global warming and the cumulative emissions of CO2, that many regions of the world will become uninhabitable and essentially around the equator and in the tropics. And the land areas contribute uh, in two ways into the evolution of climate at the global scale because they contribute or they reduce uh, global warming depending on whether they are source or sink uh, of CO2 and locally, regionally via the redistribution of energy in the form of heat or, or of water and thus they can be used to modulate uh, locally uh, some impacts or some uh, uh, some manifestation of climate change. And the problem is that if the climate gets too warm, the sink capacity of the land and the marine ecosystems can decrease, and this will further accelerate uh, global warming. And I'm done. Thank you very much.